How's it going, Eliminators? Today, we're gonna to be servicing a Massey Ferguson 2827 riding lawnmower. So let's get right into it. So my customer just dropped this off. It is raining, so I'm not gonna be filming outdoors for too much longer. I'm just gonna fire it up, let it run. It does run perfectly. Basically, my customer just wants a full service on it and then inspect everything as well. But it does fire right up. Runs perfect. And using this lever right here, I can actually move the deck up and down. Check that out, guys. So that's pretty cool. So this is Massey Ferguson 2827, and it does have a Kohler Command 27 horsepower engine on it. So this is what I'm gonna be servicing. And here's all the model information for this particular engine. So it's a 725cc CV 740 S Kohler command engine. Now that the engine is hot, I'm going to be draining the oil. So on this particular model, we're gonna come down to the right side of the engine and you're gonna look for this black tube there and they tuck it into the frame. So we're just gonna be able to pull this out and here's our oil drain plug. And because I have an empty jug, I'm gonna be using that to drain the oil into. And I just put the container here in between the wheel and the deck. You just have to put one wrench on that fitting there and then your secondary wrench on this little cap here. And because the engine's hot, the oil's draining out nicely. Also having the dipstick open will increase a little bit of airflow and help that oil come out. Next up, I have my oil tray here and I'm gonna be removing the oil filter right there. Now this model does have an oil cooling unit and the oil from this cooler should follow down the tube here into where the oil filter is and it should drain out that way. Now, depending on how tight the oil filter was installed, there's a couple ways you can get them off if they are kind of seized on there. The first method is using a belt similar to this one. You just cinch it down and they do work, but if they're wet or have a little bit of oil on them, then they will slip. The second method is getting one of these guys here. They come in different sizes and they just have these little ridges on them and those ridges correspond to the oil filter. And then you could go ahead and just use a ratchet to unthread that. Or if you don't have any of those tools, you can go ahead and take a long screwdriver and use a hammer, punch it through all the way to the other side, and then you can loosen it off by hand. If you do it that way, you're gonna have quite a bit of oil all over the place though. But as we can see here, the strap method does work. Next up, I wanna have a little better access at the front of the engine, so I'm gonna be removing the hood. This hood is quite easy. The little hangers there just go around those little posts on either side of the machine. So what you wanna do is look for your headlight wiring harness. You're gonna follow that wire all the way down until you see a plug. And I'm just gonna unplug that, and then I'm gonna remove any clips that hold the line on. So once you get your hood to about a 45 degree angle, you should be able to just pull your hood up. Sometimes it's gonna be a little tricky because we're gonna see a little bit of rust in there. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and spray that with some lubricant before I reinstall the hood. But now we have access at our air filter box, and I should be able to get access at the spark plugs a little easier now. So I'm just gonna remove this little wing nut, and that will expose our air filter. Now my customer was kind enough to provide me with part numbers from her previous invoice, so I was able to order an air filter and pre-filter. And once you get your air box cover off, you'll be able to take off your air filter wing nut here. So that plenum there goes back into your carburetor, and here's your crankcase breather tube, routing any engine gases back into the carburetor so that it can reburn. That's for emissions purposes. Now there's gonna be a little plate here. You're gonna wanna take that off, but here's why you run a pre-filter, guys, see that? So the pre-filter catches all the big stuff and then the actual paper filter inside of there catches all your fine debris. So I order my parts from Stens and we have a 100-758. There's your Kohler replacement number and we also have the pre-filter and our Stens number is a 055-089. Now before I go ahead and wrap this pre-filter around the paper air filter, I'm just gonna use a little bit of oil to get the outside of it a little bit wet. We're not trying to soak this pre-filter completely. All you want is a little tacky surface on the outside and that'll help catch any debris that might go through. Now this is the stuff that I normally use. It's PJ1 foam filter spray cleaner. Not to be confused with the foam filter cleaner spray. This one is the red can and it filters grit and sand easy. So you spray this stuff on and it just leaves a little tacky surface on your pre-filter. You don't need a whole whack of it. Normally I just take some on there, spray it on, and then with a clean hand, I'm just gonna kind of rub it into the pre-filter there. And like I said, guys, this just helps prevent debris going into your engine. Now that PJ1 spray is a little bit more expensive and it's generally only used on like dirt bikes and racing applications, but here's my reasoning behind this. If you spend a little bit more money and a little bit more time maintaining your pre-filter, then you'll actually be able to replace 
your pre-filter and you won't have to replace your air filter as frequently because your pre-filter will be preventing the dirt from going inside of the paper filter. So essentially, you're gonna save money in the long run. So with our new air filter pressed in, I just wanna make a note that there is this little guy right here. And this is essentially gonna be like a velocity stack. Kinda blocks the air from coming in this way and makes it come in from up here. So if yours does fall like this, all you're gonna do is rotate it around until you feel it lock in. So listen for the click right there. And then you're just gonna take this little guy and we're gonna push that up against that and it should hold it into place just like that. And then just using my pair of channel locks there, I just went and snugged that up just so that we know that this disc here is pushing against the air filter so that we know there is no gap along the inside there. Now, sometimes you guys can take a little bit of Vaseline and put it around the rubber seal that goes around the backside of the air filter, and that will help it seal in between the metal back casing there and the air filter itself. Next up, using a 5 8 spark plug socket, we're gonna remove the spark plugs and change them out. So looking at our engine from the front, I'm gonna say left and right side. I've laid the plugs out and we can see that the left plug is burning good and the right plug is slightly blackened and that's probably just because in the intake manifold, this cylinder here is getting slightly more fuel than that one, but no big deal because it does run good. If one plug is drastically different than the other, then you definitely have a fuel issue. White is gonna be lean and really black is gonna be rich. But in this case, my customer wants it fully serviced, so we're gonna be installing two new RC12 YC spark plugs. So I have my new Champion plug here and I'm gonna be gapping them to 30 thousandths of an inch. And now that I have both spark plugs out, with the oil filter off, the dipstick open and the oil drain tube on the other side open. What I'm gonna do is slowly, with the key off, rotate the flywheel around in a clockwise direction, and that's just gonna engage the oil pump, and any excess oil should drip out of your oil pump hole there and your drain tube there. So you guys can see that it's just the slightest amount of oil that's coming out. Now don't worry about harming your engine because there is going to be that little thin film of oil residue still on your crankshaft and all your internal engine components. So it's completely safe to turn your engine over slowly by hand. Now just to mention, new spark plugs have what's known as a crush washer, so right there. So if you're installing a new spark plug, you're gonna have to tighten it up more so than you would if you were reinstalling an older spark plug that's already been used. So it's gotten to the point where it's snug here and like I said, I'm just gonna go about a half turn until I feel a slight amount of resistance and that's it guys, that's good to go. Now that we're here, my customer also wants a new fuel filter installed but I can see that the previous person who serviced this used the smaller Kohler filter and this model actually is supposed to take the Sten's 055-113 and that is the much larger fuel filter. You can see it here. So this will filter out much more debris and it will actually be able to handle the flow of fuel for a Kohler 27 horsepower engine. It's a V-twin, so it's a dual cylinder. So the rate of fuel that it pulls in is much greater than a smaller displacement single cylinder engine. So I'm gonna be running the proper fuel filter and we're gonna replace out that one. And something to note here, not only did the previous individual replace it with the wrong improper fuel filter, but you can see here they have a green fuel line clamp and notice how the fuel line is compressed but it's not cut. Come up here to the red, a red is much tighter than a green and if we look here it's actually starting to compress and tear this fuel line. So I'm kind of glad that that happened on this upper piece because what I'm gonna do is most likely remove that clamp, replace it with a green, and then replace this length of fuel line here. But before I do go ahead and disconnect it, I'm just using a fuel line clamp here, and all that does is clamps the fuel line down to prevent any excess fuel from flowing out of the line. And while we're on the topic of fuel, if you are draining your oil and you go ahead and check your dipstick, and the oil level in your dipstick is like way up here, for instance, and it smells like fuel, then you most likely have a pinhole in your diaphragm on your fuel pump here. And there's a tube here that goes all the way back to your crankcase there. And basically as your piston moves up in the cylinder, it creates a negative pressure in your crankcase, which sucks this diaphragm out like this through this line here. And then when the piston comes back down, it puts a positive pressure in your crankcase, which then puts a positive pressure in this line. And then that pushes your diaphragm back in. And that continuous change in crankcase pressure creates a pulsing action in your fuel pump. And that's what pumps your fuel from your fuel tank 
into your carburetor. So again, if you do smell gas in your oil, go ahead and just change your fuel pump. They run anywhere from about 15 to $25 and it's an easy fix. So I've got a new piece of fuel line that I cut to length here. Now there is a natural bend to this line. So when I hook it back up, I'm gonna be routing it with that natural bend in mind. So looking at the bottom fuel line that runs back to the tank, I've discovered that it does have a little crease or nick into it. Instead of changing the entire fuel line that goes all the way back to the fuel tank, what we can do is cut it like right about here and I can run a fuel shutoff valve and then I can replace this portion with a new line and then they can go ahead and shut the fuel off when they're storing it and run the engine dry. So because someone ran the previous fuel filter, the fuel line now is really loose and we can see that it's kind of uh, bored out the inside of this fuel line a little bit because on this fuel filter here, it doesn't have a little expansion area. Whereas on this fuel filter here, the improper one, we can see it does. So this has widened our fuel line a little bit, but there's also quite a bit of extra slack here. So what I think I'm gonna do is I'm going to install my new oil filter first and I'll show you guys how to prime that. And then once the oil filter is sticking out, then I can kind of rope my fuel line. So you can see that I've come down and I've gone inside of the choke throttle cable there. I can just come through here and put my shutoff valve here and then we'll be able to actually cut this line a little shorter. So I've moved my fuel line clamp up the line a little bit to give me a little bit extra room to do that. Then I'll be able to install a new piece of fuel line like this one that'll fit nice and tight. And here I'm using a new fuel line clamp as well. One that isn't going to pinch that fuel line too hard and damage it. So I have my new replacement oil filter here. It is a Stens part number 120-345. There is your John Deere, Briggs & Stratton and Kohler replacement number, but we're going to have to prime this thing first because we don't want to put it in dry. Now the oil capacity for this particular engine is 1.6 to 1.8 liters of 10W30. So what I'm going to do is measure out a specific amount in just an empty oil container here, and then I'm going to fill my oil filter up to about halfway, and I'm just going to let it sit and that paper filter in here will soak up that oil. So by using this as a gauge, I can see that I have subtracted 800 milliliters from a maximum total of 1.8 liters, 1.8 liters being 1800 milliliters, so that means there should be an approximate one liter remaining. And this is known as priming an oil filter. And all that does is it prevents your machine from starting up dry. I've also added a little bit of oil to the rubber seal that goes around the oil filter. And when I tighten that up, that'll just ensure that that doesn't chafe or rip. So you wanna get your oil filter just hand tight, guys. I've seen people crank them down and you really don't have to because then you're gonna over compress that little rubber seal in there and that's what you don't wanna do. I've also placed a little towel underneath there. Make sure that it doesn't get pinched in between the oil filter and the engine. Once you get it hand tight, go ahead and use two hands and just snug it up some more. Don't over tighten it guys cause you'll have a heck of a time getting that off. But now I can move on to routing my fuel line, something like that. So I'll have my shutoff valve here. So when they go to store this machine before winter, they can shut the fuel off and then they can just run the engine dry and that'll prevent the carburetor from gumming up. And and I did want to note that there is a flow arrow on both the fuel filter and the fuel shutoff valve here. So again, I'm just going to be hooking that up. It's pretty straightforward. We're going to leave the clamps off just so I can rotate things and line the shutoff valve up. But looking at the fuel line here, I don't have to use a new fuel line on the back side because essentially it was long enough that I was just able to cut it in half. Now here's that little nick. So this right piece is the one that I'm going to be discarding. But again, if we look at the ID, which is the inside diameter, both ends here are looking okay. If we look at the other side though, we can see that the one where they ran it to the fuel filter here on the right, that is bored out slightly bigger. So I'm going to be discarding that piece and I'm going to use this piece here and I'm just going to hook that up and I'm going to install some new fuel line clamps and that should take care of the fuel line. So I have shutoff valve installed, new fuel filter installed, but I can see that my fuel line is ever so slightly hitting the oil filter and that's going to heat up and I don't want to have those things touching. So instead of cutting away from here to shorten that line up, I'm going to just pop this off and I'm going to cut that a little bit shorter and that should in theory, raise that up ever so slightly. So there we have it, guys. We have our new fuel filter installed, three new fuel line clamps. I was able to reuse her fuel line on the back side there. The fuel line does not hit the oil filter, which will heat up. So that'll prevent any issues there. And before I go ahead and put the air filter cover back on, here is your engine maintenance 
recommendation. So that's what Kohler recommends right there, guys. Now, before I go ahead and put the rest of my 800 milliliters of oil into the engine here, I'm going to reinstall my oil drain plug cap here. I'm just putting some Teflon tape on it. That'll help seal up the threads. And we're going to tighten that back into our drain tube, tuck our drain tube back into our frame, and then I'll go ahead and fill this up with oil. Now, again, this machine did call for a maximum of 1.8 liters of 10W30 or 10W40 if you'd like to run it, but that's going to be the maximum amount. So because I have 800 milliliters in the engine already, I'm going to add another 800 milliliters, which will give me a total of 1600 milliliters, which equates to 1.6 liters. So there's another 800 milliliters and that's going into the engine. So I'm just going to let that drain for a few seconds. And then once I do get my dipstick screwed back in, then I'm going to go to the cooling fins here and we're just going to blow them out. And I'm trying to get the reflection on camera, but if you guys can see it, we are directly at the halfway mark between the add and the full. So I'm trying my best to get a nice little reflection on there so you guys can see that line. So 1.6 liters is perfect for the halfway mark. That will be good enough to fire this engine up. And then once we run it, you have to remember that the oil pump is gonna be engaged and it's gonna be putting oil into the oil filter. So that's gonna take some oil away from your dipstick. So after we let this engine run for about five or 10 minutes when we're done, then I'll go ahead and recheck the oil then. So I now have the machine jacked up using my Mojack. So you just drive your tires onto the little holders there and then using a drill or just a hand crank you can go and crank this up and it locks at the bottom so instead of needing jack stands it has a little lock at the bottom of that to prevent it from dropping back down so i have my little patio chair pad here and i'm going to go up underneath this thing and we're going to remove the three blades and we're going to sharpen and balance them and lifting the front of the mower just allows me to come up underneath the deck here and we can see that there is a little bit of grass that's stuck to the deck but nothing too serious so using a 5 8 socket i'm going to remove the blades one by one get them sharpened up and balanced and while they're removed then i'm going to go in there and just scrape away any grass that is stuck to the deck and then i can go ahead and undercoat the deck to prevent it from rotting out so the first blade came off nicely and we're just going to remember that when we go to put this back on the high point is going to be to the bottom right side and like i said with the blade off it's just easier to come up under here and scrape away any of this old dried grass because you're going to end up seeing stuff like this guys so right in here we can see that the paint is chipping away so like i said i'm just going to go and scrape up all the grass that I can. It doesn't have to be perfect. If I was doing this for myself, I'd scrape it, use a wire wheel. I'd probably go ahead and repaint it. If you want to see more about how I clean up and protect my mower decks, you can check out the video in the top right of your screen. Now, as I'm scraping this deck, something that I should notice is there is going to be this little cap here. So I'm just going to go ahead and take that off and lay it to the side so that when I do go ahead to install my blade, then I can go and fit that on and then put my blade on. There's also grease fittings here for your spindle. So I'm going to clean that up and then I'll go ahead and grease this before I put the blade on so that the spindle is nice and lubricated. Now there's going to be a little ball bearing on your grease fitting. You guys can see it there and sometimes they're going to seize into position. So what I have here is just a small slotted screwdriver and I just use the edge of it to push that ball bearing in that acts as a check valve. So that grease that goes in, doesn't come back out. So if you connect your grease gun fitting and you start pumping it up and grease is coming out all around the sides there, then chances are it's that little check ball in there that's seized. So go ahead and just depress it and then you should be able to pump some grease into your spindle. So undercoating mower decks is kind of a controversial topic. A lot of people say that it doesn't work and the other half of the people say that they swear by it. I am one of the people that swear by it and as long as you use the right stuff, so I am using some Rust Cure Formula 3000. Again, check the video out that I linked to you guys. I just use a brush and I got a little bit better lighting under here so you can see it. I'm just laying it in and you really don't have to worry about getting the deck completely clean. Even if there's a little bit of grass still stuck to the deck, this stuff will actually absorb into the grass will absorb into the bare metal that is starting to show. And all it does is create a protective barrier in between the outside air and your mower deck metal. Okay, so I now have my spindle all greased up. You guys can see a little bit of excess. So essentially you're just gonna keep pumping it until you see some excess come out. And then I'm just gonna wipe off the little extra there and I can go ahead and install my sharpened blade. Now you're gonna notice that on your spindle shaft, there's gonna be a hex there 
and that correlates to this washer here. So what's going to happen is you're going to have your little dust cap that's going to go on first, then your blade's going to go on, then you're going to have this washer here with the little hex on it, and then you're going to have the other washer. So it will look a little something like this once it's done. So I do have this blade all sharpened up now. There's a nice edge on it and I've balanced it and I'm just moving on to the center one. And when I'm putting these blades back on guys, I am kind of staggering them. So I'm gonna go left and right on the far one. I'm gonna go front to back on the middle one and then I'm gonna go left to right on this one as well. So I now have the deck scraped down, undercoated, reinstalled the blades so that now all of them are ready to go. So they're all locked in position and I'm ready to drop my machine back down to the ground. And before I put the hood back down, I've just hit the little studs with some white lithium grease. That should help the hood slide off a little easier next time. And once you get your hood reinstalled, you're going to come down here, plug in your headlights again. And by the way, there is the official model number right there, guys. So next up, I'm looking at the right steering spindle and I have the tires aimed to the left and I'm just gonna come over here and wipe off this little grease fitting. I'm gonna be doing the same thing, taking my little slotted screwdriver and just poking in that check ball and then we're gonna pump up some grease into these as well. And then on the left side, you're just gonna turn your wheel to the right and then we can come and do the same thing, fill it up with the grease. Now I'm just checking tire pressure, making sure that we have 20 PSI in the rears and then a max inflation of 28 PSI in the front. Perfect. So I'm just letting it run for a few minutes, guys. Let that oil circulate through the engine. This is all the stuff that I pulled out from under the deck there. So you guys can see it's quite a bit. And over time, if this got wet, what'll happen is it'll retain moisture and it'll just kind of leach the water into your metal deck ever so slowly. And this is the kind of stuff that completely destroys a mower deck guys so that's why I scrape them and undercoat them right here so you guys can see there's paint coming off and you know just routine yearly maintenance and it will save you from having to replace your deck one day so to check your dipstick after you've been running a machine all you're going to do is pull your dipstick wipe it off put it back in and depending on your specific model you either have to dip it or you have to thread it in in this case we thread it in but you can see that our oil levels right there and if we flip it over that's approximately just under the halfway mark. So we were half and we're just here right now. So I'm gonna add the extra 200 milliliters of oil and that should bring us right to the full line. And because I'm transferring oil into a smaller container, I know exactly how much I'm putting in. So we had 1600 milliliters plus two is gonna give us 1800 milliliters. And that'll give us a total of 1,800 milliliters or 1.8 liters of 10W30, right on the money as per the manual recommends. Now it might be a little difficult to see, but we are in fact right on the money at the full line. And then one thing to note before I wrap things up guys is when you are running it, you just wanna go ahead and make sure there's no oil leaking out of your oil filter. So I just went and wiped up the excess and ran it and nothing is dripping out. So I know that my oil filter's nice and tight. There's no fuel leaking out because some of these little shutoff valves here, they do come from China and they're not made to the highest standards. So sometimes they do leak, but this one doesn't. And you guys heard it it is running good so this Massey Ferguson here is fully serviced and ready to go back to my customer so that's it for today's video guys it went a little longer than I thought but there was quite a bit of information that I wanted to put in there so that it pretty much covered everything you would need to know if you guys enjoyed the video think about leaving me a thumbs up you know it really helps me out you can click here to subscribe and click over here to watch one of my previous videos I upload every single week so be sure to come on back next week check the channel out for new content and as always guys Thanks for watching.